I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. Good. Tell me, do you know the story of Robin Hood? Oh, yes, and it's a wonderful story. Well, we're going to begin reading the story of Robin Hood next week in the Comic Weekly. Oh, I can hardly wait. Now tell me, do you remember who Eleanor Dale was? Oh, yes. He was Robin Hood's friend. Well, I've got a surprise for you. You're going to meet Eleanor Dale today. I am? You are. Walt Disney has just finished making a movie of Robin Hood. And there'd be no Robin Hood without Alan Adale. So I want you to meet Elton Hayes, England's best-known singer of ballads, who plays Alan Adale in the moving picture Robin Hood. Elton, this is my friend, Little Miss Honey. Well, I'm awfully happy to meet you, Little Miss Honey. Oh, and I'm happy to meet you. Are you really in the picture of Robin Hood? Why, certainly. And I had a wonderful time making it. Oh, tell me about it, please. Well, you see, King Richard the Lionheart leaves England to lead a crusade to the Holy Land. And while he's gone... His treacherous brother, Prince John, conspires to seize the throne and has the wicked sheriff of Nottingham to help him. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, now, Robin Hood, who is faithful to the good King Richard, rallies round him in Sherwood Forest a band of fearless men who defy the bad sheriff and Prince John and help return Richard to power again as king. And the story of their adventures is an exciting and dashing one. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I like Robin Hood because he fought against the bad men, and you helped him, didn't you? <laughs> yes, as Alan Adale in the picture, I did. Oh, uh, please tell me more about Alan Adale. Well, if you remember, Alan Adale was a singer who also played a lute and always entertained Robin Hood and his merry band by singing delightful old English ballads to them. Yes, and whenever Robin Hood was tired and sad, Alan Adele would cheer him up by singing to him. <laughs> he would indeed. How well you remember. Oh, yeah. she remembers all right. You know, Elton, I'm sure she'd like to hear something about the songs that you sing in the movie. Well, there's one that's called Riddledy Diddledy Day, which I know you'll love. Oh, would you tell me about it, please? Oh, I'll do better than that. I brought you a recording I made of it. Oh, thank you. Uh, could, could we play it right now? Well, yes, if you wish. Oh, goody. All right. And here for everyone to hear is Riddledy Diddledy Day, sung by Eleanor Dale in Walt Disney's movie, Robin Hood. Singer songs are rather key song as I roll along my way. With a hate every day and a daddy die do and a riddle a diddle de day de day and a riddle a diddle de day. Hark to the tale of Robin Hood and of his merry men. He's like you are not like to see in all the world again. His bow was long, his arm was strong, and his heart was good and true. Well did he fight to gain the right. And so I pray may you, oh, I'll sing a song, a rollicky song as I roll along my way, with a hate every day and a dairy die do and a riddle in Italy day. Oh, that's a lovely song. Yes, I liked it too. Well, and I tell you what, you can keep this record. Oh, really? Thank you. Not at all. And I know you'll have much pleasure in reading Robin Hood in Puck the Comic Weekly. I'm sure we will, because the artwork will be in those wonderful Walt Disney drawings. And that should make everyone happy. Well, Elton Hayes, you've certainly made us happy by coming to tell us about Robin Hood. Yes, and thank you very much for the record. <laughs> You're welcome. And I'll be listening when you tell Robin Hood's story next week on the Comic Weekly. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye Alan Adele. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Now can you please read the bunnies? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yeah. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, Big Ben Bolt. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Faint and punch and dodge and twist. It's a knockout blow from Big Ben's fist. sets out on a tour of the country with Spider, his manager, to box the local champion of different towns. After several one-night stands, they arrive in Beaver Rapids, where Ben is to fight the local favorite. Ben climbs into the ring, 
looks over the crowd assembled and sees businessmen, cattlemen, cowpunchers, and some Indians. And then, a man in a ten-gallon hat and wearing cowboy boots makes an announcement to the crowd. All right, men! All right! Big Ben Bolt offers a thousand bucks to anybody who can go three rounds with him. And nobody's collected off of him yet. Last picture top row, a tall husky Indian walks toward the ring. Hey, you show him, Johnny! First picture bottom row, the Indian climbs into the ring and begins to remove his headdress. Spider, Ben's manager, says... Uh, now, Chief, listen to me. You, uh, no fight him with feet or tomahawk. Catch him? The Indian replies... Uh, cut the corn, little man. I learned enough about box fighting as intercollegiate heavyweight champ to make your boy wish he stood in bed. You catch him? Spider stares in surprise at the educated Indian as he goes to his corner. Then he goes to Ben's corner and says to Ben, Hey, Ben, this Geronimo was no Simon Pure kid, so don't take no foolish chances. As the fighters go to the center of the ring to get their instructions from the referee, another Indian appears beside Spider and says, You see Johnny Tall Pine win fair fight, mister. Spider replies, Ah, beat it, sitting bull. I don't need no directions. Suddenly, Spider feels a knife pressing against his back. And last picture, the Indian says, Maybe no, maybe yes. Johnny better win, though. What does the Indian mean saying he wants a fair fight when he sticks a knife in Spider's back? Now, there's nothing fair about that. No, and Ben is in a strange town surrounded by all those rough, strange men. Do you think the other people will see that Ben is treated fairly? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now? Oh, now, let's go over the page to page three, because I know Prince Valiant will be there. Right, over we go. And you are right as usual. Here is Prince Valiant on page three. And last week, remember, he was trying to get all the evidence that, that, that Sigurd Holm was a tyrant and was cruel to his people. So he disguised himself as one of Sigurd's men and slipped into the castle after dark. And then he found out that the servant girls were prisoners in Sigurd's castle. So now he has the evidence. Yes, he has the evidence. So let's read and find out what happens next with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. Daylight comes. The gum on Prince Valiant's face is long since dried, and his false beard has fallen away. He sits in the dark sleeping stall while slaves clean away the debris of last night's big party. Finally, Val parts the hangings and beckons one of the servants over. He must now risk treachery. The servant comes over, and Val whispers to him, I am your prince. I've come to free you from slavery. Will you help me? Oh, yes, sire. Even though it means my life if I am caught. Quickly, Val changes clothes with the servant. And then last picture top row, dressed in the servant's rags, he sweeps up an armful of straw and, shielding his face with it, makes his way out of the dining hall. He hides in the stable during the day, and after dark that night, he takes all the rope he can find, and second picture bottom row makes his way to the platform overhanging a deep abyss. Then quickly, he fastens his rope to the logs of the platform, and then last picture, slowly he descends. And then he comes to the end of his rope. Below, the water roars madly. If he drops, he will fall into the rushing waters, yet he cannot return to the castle. And there in the dark, he hangs. Ooh, that's a terrible decision. There might be rocks down there in the water, and, and he could be killed if he dropped onto them. Yes, it looks like a long fall, but if he goes back to the castle, he'd be caught. Oh, I wonder what he'll do. Well, next week, I'm sure we'll find out. Now, would you like to see what's happening to Hopalong Castle? Oh, yes, please. Very well, go to the very last page of the first section. All right. And here's Hoppy. And last week, you remember that Hoppy captured Selden, that man who was trying to run Hoppy and his friends Buck and Rose Peters out of the country. And Selden told Hoppy that the man who was behind all of the trouble was Judge Paget of the town of Rimfire. And now could we read and see where the judge has been caught? We certainly can. Here we go with Hopalong Cassidy. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hopalong. <laughs> A 
Hoppy, Lucky, and California are saddling up to leave. And Hoppy is saying to Buck Peters, Well, thanks to Selden's confession, justice has finally caught up with Judge Padgett. The Rock and W belongs to you and Rose. Free and clear now, Buck. Your troubles are over. Rose Peters tells Hoppy as far as she's concerned, troubles are just beginning because it'll take a lot of fixing to put this ranch in working order. California says, Well, don't look at me. I gotta be getting back to the bar 20 with Hoppy and the boys. Suddenly, Lucky says, Hey, look, party of horsemen headed this way. Buck exclaims, Oh, no, what? Last picture, top row, the riders rein up in front of Buck. One of them says, You own this bread? Why, well, yeah. And I got the deed to prove it. First picture, bottom row, the man says, Well, mount up. We're taking you into town, Peters. Buck reaches for his gun. Hoppy says, No, 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 no. Stow the gun, Buck. We'll go along with you till this matter's cleared up. Short time later, third picture, bottom row. Buck is brought into the sheriff's office and shoved into a chair. He stares at the circle of men grimly facing him. And then he says, hey, What's this all about? And one of the men says sternly, Or Empire owes you something besides the treatment you received at his newest citizen. And since the town needs a sheriff, we just held a special election. And you won. <laughs> Buck sees the faces of everybody in the room breaking through with grins, and he exclaims, last picture. Why, you, you, you mean I'm sheriff? Where's Hoppy? I, I gotta tell Hoppy. Oh, he already knows about it, Buck. Cassidy's agenda gave us the idea. You won't catch him now. He said to tell you he's on his way back to the bar 20. <laughs> oh, that was a good joke on him. <laughs> for the way that ended. Now Buck's going to be the sheriff and I know everything will be honest and fair. Yes, that was quite a joke those men played on Buck. <laughs> yes, he certainly was surprised. I think it's wonderful that he had a friend like Hoppy. <laughs> yes, Hoppy's troubles are over and so are Buck's. And now it's time to pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. And I know that Dagwood and Blondie will be there. And I'll read Dagwood and Blondie in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, well, my lady. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Today, Herb Woodley is home alone while his wife Tootsie is away visiting. Herb says to himself, Oh, it's lonesome with Tootsie away. I'll phone Dagwood and see if he wants to play checkers. <laughs> A moment later, Dagwood, who's outside Herb's window, hears Herb calling Blondie on the phone. Oh, uh, hello, Blondie. Uh, may I speak to Dagwood? <laughs> and Blondie, last picture top row, on the phone in her house says... I think Dagwood is out in the yard. Hold the phone, Herb, and I'll get him. Oh, thank you. First picture, second row. Blondie dashes out of the house and says to the children... We've got to find Daddy. He's wondering on the phone. <laughs> At this moment, Dagwood, who had been out on the lawn and heard Herb ask for him, comes into Herb's house and says, Oh, I heard you calling me, Herb. Uh, uh, what, 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 what did you want? Oh, Dagwood. Uh, wait, hold the phone for me, will you? Blondie's out looking for you. I gotta find her and tell her you're here. <laughs> Herb dashes all about, but can't find Blondie anywhere. Last picture, second row. Dagwood sits in Herb's house, the phone in his hand, sound asleep. <laughs> First picture, third row, Herb sees Dagwood's daughter, Cookie, and he yells, Oh, Cookie, oh, oh, where's your mama? Well, she's running all over like mad, trying to find Daddy. At this moment, Blondie is in the house at the phone again. Hello, Herb. I'm sorry, but I've scoured the neighborhood, and I just can't find Dagwood any place. At the other end of the line, Dagwood wakes up. Hearing the voice on the phone says brightly, Oh, but, but Herb is not here. Uh, this is Dagwood Bumstead. I will give him your message when he returns. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, Herb dashes into the Bumstead house. Oh, Herb, Dagwood's at your house. Uh, yeah, I know it, I know it. Give me the phone, I want to talk to him. Blondie hands Herb the phone. Uh, hello, Dagwood, this is Herb. And Dagwood on the phone at Dagwood's, uh, at Herb's house says, Uh, yeah, what did you want me for, Herb? Um, uh, uh, Suddenly, a blank look comes over Herb's face. 
Oh, gosh, now I forgot why I phoned you. Blondie looks very surprised as Herb walks out of the house. He meets Dagwood coming out of his house. And as they pass each other, Herb says, last picture... Uh, if I think of it, I'll call you back. Okay, Herb. And Blondie goes... <laughs> That's the funniest thing I've ever seen, the way they got all mixed up. Yes, that really was funny. Herb not being able to remember what he called Dagwood about in the first place. <laughs> yes, that was funny. What was it he called Dagwood to do? Why, it was to... Uh, uh, uh -oh. I was so busy laughing, I forgot what it was myself. <laughs> so did I. But I haven't forgotten Roy Rogers. He's right below Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I'm anxious to read that because last week, Roy and a man named Corny Maxim were held up by a young boy who was pretending to be Teddy Knox, and that's the, the son of the owner of the Knox Ranch. But Roy and Corny discovered that this was somebody in disguise. So Roy quickly overcame the boy, and they put him in the covered wagon. But the boy was just pretending to be unconscious. And then Roy rode off to the ranch to investigate, leaving the boy with Corny Maxie. I wonder what he'll find out. Well, let's read and see. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. hi yip hi -oh. now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi -oh. <laughs> As soon as Roy rides off, the boy sticks a broom in Corny's back, trying to hold him up. But the trick doesn't fool Corny. Third picture top row, he turns around and says, Teddy Knox's notes inside that locket, and he said that he's held captive at the Box K Ranch. That means you're a fake. The boy answers, Oh, you got it all figured out, huh? Suddenly, he swings the broom. <laughs> Knocks Corny out. And now I gotta do something to stop Rogers before he finds the real Teddy Knox. Meanwhile, first picture bottom row, Roy arrives at the Box K Ranch. He sees a man on the porch. He reins in and says, Howdy, like to see Mr. Knox about a personal matter. I'm Roy Rogers. The man answers, <coughs> uh, Lawyer Costas at your service. I uh, regret to say Mr. Knox died last month. His son Teddy now owns the Box K, but uh, he isn't here. <coughs> uh, may I help? Roy takes out the gold locket and shows it to the man. Well, this, uh, this gold locket was tied to a box case steer. You, you, any idea how it got there? The lawyer looks at the locket. And then he sees the boy riding up and dismounts at one of the buildings a short distance away. The lawyer stalls for a time, saying, Um, locket, huh? <clears throat> well. He sees the boy with a shovel begin to sneak up behind Roy. And he says, very slowly, last picture, Uh, frankly, uh, <clears throat> the locket once belonged to Teddy's dead mother, Rogers. But uh, this information will do you no good now. Roy says, huh? Well, why not? The boy who's behind Roy lifts the shovel to knock Roy out and says to himself, well, you'll know in a second, cowboy. Oh, I, I wish Roy would turn around and see what's going on behind him. So do I, because these men are up to something crooked. Do you think that boy will knock Roy out? Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to discover. Now let's go over the page, because I know you're anxious to read Flash Gordon. Yes, I am, because Flash is on the planet Rhea, and he's been fighting the giants. And remember that Sami had conquered the king of the giants and then challenged Flash to a hand-to-hand -hand combat, promising that the winners should rule the planet. And last week, Flash whipped the giant in a fight, but then the other giants began to move toward Flash angrily, and, and I'm anxious to see whether they'll keep their word. Let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rig rig doon doon sashkimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Sammy lies on the ground, Flash kneeling over him, the victor. The giant Rians begin to close in on Flash. But quickly, Kara, Sammy's sister, bars the way. She tells him that Sammy had deposed the king and now has bested Sammy by combat. And by the Rian law, Flash should be king. To her surprise, last picture top row, Flash drops to one knee before her and says, I am an Earthman. I have no desire to rule your planet. If I am king, I hereby abdicate. And then rising, he shouts... Long live the queen! And for a moment, the Rians stand in sun surprise. In the first picture, bottom row, with the fickle enthusiasm of a mob, they take up Flash's cry. Lifting Kara to their shoulders, they bear her to the palace in triumph. As her first official act following the coronation, Kara summons Flash. She tells him that she is queen through his kindness, that he should name his reward. 
Flash smiles and says, All I ask is peace between Rhea and Earth. Not only does Kara grant Flash's wish, but she orders his rocket ship loaded with Rhea's most advanced scientific models. After brief farewell ceremonies, Zarkov takes the controls. And last picture, the spaceship blasts off for the perilous trip back to Earth. Oh, goody, 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 Flash won. And Kara's keeping her word, and so now he can go home again. But it's a dangerous trip back to Earth. Do you think he'll get back safely? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now let's go to the very last page, because I know you'd like to read Dick's adventures. Oh, you know I would, because Dick's in the early days of America with some settlers. Yes, they founded a town and named it Seattle after a friendly Indian chief. And last week, just as the story ended, Dick thought he heard Indian drums. And I wonder if these people are going to have trouble with the Indians who are not kindred. Well, let's read now and find out. Say the magic words with me. Rickety pack a zack a zick. That's some music for adventurous Dick. Dick and old Seattle listen carefully. Sure enough, off in the distance comes the sound of drums. Last picture, top row, old Chief Seattle cries, Look, the hot fires of vengeance, the black smoke of death. My hot-tempered young warriors are coming to fight their last battle. But they are doomed. Their pale faces cannot be beat, even though they die. Quickly, Seattle tells Dick to alert the settlers. Then he hurries to meet the warriors, his own people, to try and stop them and turn them back. They refuse to listen to Seattle, but rush past him. Big picture, second row, to burn and massacre the pale faces in the village. Sadly, the old chief, first picture, bottom row, awaits their return. Late that night, the Indians file past them. Defeated and broken in spirit, the pale faces have won. Next morning, as the white men are at their work, one of Dick's companions looks out to sea and sees two ships approaching. He exclaims, Well, now we can roll up our sleeves and get back to work. You see those ships are coming in? They all want lumber. There's plenty of work for everybody. Sure, the Indians too. We're going to grow. Oh, I'm sorry that the Indians wouldn't listen to Seattle because it's much better for people to get along together. Yes, and as the man says to Dick, there's work for everybody. The Indians too. Will they have peace now? Well, I hope so, but you can't be too sure. We'll find out more about that next week. Now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, I've been so worried all week, wondering whether the horses on board that ship were all right, because you remember that mean man, Blackie Kirk, wanted to sink the ship so the horses would be drowned so that he could collect the money on the insurance. Yes, and Mr. Miles had sold the horses, and they were being delivered by ship to Florida by Rusty and some others. And when a storm came up, the captain of the ship ordered all hands to take to the lifeboat. And it looked like everybody on the ship got to shore all right, but I'm worried about the horses. Well, let's find out what happens next. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. (laughs) On the island, Rusty says to Clem, the old sailor they've been friendly with, Hey, Clem, by the time the tide's all out, I believe we can practically walk out to the ship and maybe get the horses off. Yeah, you might be right, Rusty. But that tub don't look like it's damaged none. She's only around. A couple of good sea tugs will pull her off as soon as the skipper notifies the coast guard. Tex says, Well, that might be true, Clem, if the skipper notifies him. Well, I don't know. So far, I can't figure why, but I don't think the captain and Kirk want help. Because if they did, why do they put the ship's radio out of commission? Pete suggests that they ought to search the island and see what it's like. Last picture, top row, Tex says... Yeah, you're right, Pete. Uh, Clem and I'll take the shoreline. You youngsters explore the interior. Uh, You're better fitted for scrambling up them rocks. You find this plenty of grass and fresh water on the island. Good place for the horses. And then, 
Second picture bottom roll. Pete and Rusty discover a man lying on the beach. Golly, Pete, it's the ship's radio man. The one they call Sparks. I I is he dead? I don't think so, Rusty. No, no, he's in bad shape, but he's alive. Tex is worried about the horses, and he and Clem decide to get to work to get them off the ship while the tide is low. But meanwhile, last picture, in the ship launch many miles down the coast, the captain of the ship and Blackie have been cruising around hoping that the ship will be pounded to pieces and be sunk. The captain says, Hey, we're nearly out of gas, Blackie. We haven't got too much drinking water. Blackie replies, Okay, Crump. Start looking for a place to put in. By this time, that tub must be smashed to scrap iron on those rocks. Oh, I just hate those two men who are willing to let the horses be drowned. So do I. I don't think there's anything worse than being cruel to animals that can't protect themselves. Neither do I. Oh, I hope that Rusty and his friends get the horses off the ship before the tide comes in again. Do you think they will? Well, we'll find out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, don't forget, next week is the week we begin reading Robin Hood, Walt Disney's Robin Hood. Now, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly 